Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of ULI Toronto, welcome to today's program, Revitalizing the Danforth Garage Car Barn. My name is Arthur Ho Wong, and I'm co-chair of ULI Toronto's Outreach Committee. As people continue to trickle in, we're going to play a video about the Urban Land Institute's upcoming spring meeting. For those of you who don't know, ULI Spring Meeting is a dynamic annual conference about the real estate industry, which gathers leaders from all around North America and beyond. That the next spring meeting will take place this coming May, right here in Toronto. I'll see you back shortly. What a beautiful video. It definitely got me excited for the spring meeting. I'm sure it got you excited as well. UI Toronto is expected to welcome 4,000 people from across the real estate and land use industries to Toronto from May 16th to 18th of next year. This is your chance to make valuable connections, listen to unparalleled speakers, and join exclusive tours. To learn more about the 2023 spring meeting, there will be links in the chat. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arthur Ho Wong, and I'm co-chair of ULI Toronto's Outreach Committee. One of the main functions of the Outreach Committee is to organize what are called TAP, Technical Assistance Panels. The purpose of a TAP is to solve a real estate or land use problem that's being faced by a government, government agency, or nonprofit. The panels are multidisciplinary, being composed of professionals from various disciplines across the real estate and land use industry. I'm thrilled to be hosting today's webinar about the TAP that the Outreach Committee organized for our sponsor, CreateTO, which is a municipal government agency that manages the City of Toronto's real estate portfolio. A big thank you to CreateTO for giving ULI this opportunity. The subject of the TAP was a five acre property located at Danforth and Coxwell, which we'll call the Danforth Garage site. The TAP submitted a report to CreateTO with the recommendations about how to achieve the city's and CreateTO's vision for the site, which we'll explore in this webinar. Before we dive into the heart of the program, as always, we'll begin with a land acknowledgement. I think the practice of doing a land acknowledgement is especially significant for today's program, because as you know, the topic of today's webinar is a five acre piece of land in Toronto. Part of the site was previously used as a TDC vehicle garage or car barn, which has architectural heritage value. We'll describe the site in more detail later in the program. But it's important for us to remember that even before the TDC's historical use of the site, the land was inhabited by many Indigenous people. So, 
As a Toronto region-based organization, ULI acknowledges the Danforth Garage site is the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. To better understand the meaning behind this land acknowledgement, ULI recommends four programs that have been uploaded to YouTube. These links are available in the chat. Today's event and all other ULI programming would not be possible without the support of ULI's annual sponsors. I'd like to thank all sponsors for their continued support. Now, more than ever, ULI Toronto relies on the support of sponsors to put on high quality programs such as this one and to drive our mission. To all of the sponsors, a big thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Gabriella Sukari, VP Development at CreateCO. Gabriella will set the context for today's program by describing in more detail the site, what CreateCO asked the TAP to do, and where things stand today. Before I hand it over to Gabriella, I'm going to provide a bit more background on ULI's technical assistance panel. Since 1947, the Urban Land Institute has offered municipalities or public agencies a panel of multidisciplinary professionals to take a fresh look at the land use challenge for opportunity. The panel members offer their time and expertise pro bono, as do the volunteers of the organizing committee of which I'm co-chair. Panels do not have a stake in the advice that they're offering. We're happy to discuss the TAP process with anyone interested, and we'll put our email in the chat if so. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Gabriella. Thanks, Arthur. Um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and to I'm happy to be here uh, along with uh, the ULI TAP uh, partners and Councillor Bradford. I'm, I'm going to kick off the discussion uh, just to kind of ground the work that the TAP uh, did on, on our behalf for the site that is now known to many as the Downforth Garage. Um, next, Denise. I think Arthur provided you this context. We have a five-acre site located, located at the intersection of Danforth uh, and Coxwell, a uh, stone's throw to the uh, Coxwell-Danforth uh, station. Next, Denise. The site currently holds uh, or accommodates um, Tobias House, which is a residential home for adults uh, with uh, challenging uh, physical um, and mobility issues, um, a surface parking lot that accommodates the, the current Danforth car, car barn, which accommodates the TTC and some of their functions. And it is also home to the Toronto Public uh, Library, the Coxwell Danforth, Danforth Library. Next, Denise. The project is uh, founded on sort of uh, four key uh, pillars. Um, the guiding principles that informed a master plan an accommodation of city uses on the site, uh, a series of heritage parameters that, in, that will inform the adoptive reuse of the historic car bar barns, both as an interim and a long-term use, and the Housing Now initiative, which will inform the delivery of affordable housing on the site. The opportunity here today, and one that we welcome the input of the ULI TAP, was to consolidate the city uses and bring in other private and nonprofit uses to supplement all of this while trying to build a sustainable financial business model to ground the, um, the project. Next, Denise. Our city stakeholders are, are outlined here for you. Uh, I won't go through them. Um, in terms of our objectives, next, Denise. The project objectives really are to bring together a comprehensive mixed use development that adheres to the principles of the master plan, but does it in a financial business model that is sustainable and is not a burden on the city. It delivers housing that is required by the Housing Now initiative, and it accommodates the city uses and does so in a sensitive way that respects the heritage and the history of the physical space that we're coming into. In Next, Denise. So we found ourselves at a kind of opportune time when ULI um, approached us to 
assist us in answering the big question. And that is, how do we deliver um, a cultural, significant cultural hub as a destination for the east end of the city that accommodates the city's uses and needs and creates this vibrant cultural community and employment de destination as a catalyst for revitalization in the neighborhood, all grounded in a sustainable financial model. And it is through that work that I'm happy to turn it off to uh, Paul and the ULI team who um, completed their, their work uh, and their final report. Thanks very much, uh, Gabriella. Um, uh, also a pleasure to be here and to share the results of our work. I'm just gonna uh, be very brief and run through this. Um, talk just a little bit about the scope uh, of the project that we engaged ourselves in. As you know, it's five acres, it's at a subway station, long transit history of this site back from uh, 1915 when uh, it was first developed. But maybe more important, it's, it's got a really great future that can be the key focus of the East End community. Uh, lots of ideas have been developed over the years from the community. In fact, apparently I'm told over the last 18 years, so people have spent a lot of time on this, but nothing has happened to date. So ULI has sort of brought some fresh eyes into this, and I'm going to share the results of that uh, with you in terms of interim and long-term uses. And if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, these are the stakeholders and the city sponsors. I won't go through all the names. Uh, you can read them for yourself, but clearly uh, we've got a lot of expertise uh, represented from a wide variety of different perspectives. Next. Now this is a really important slide. One of the things that I wanted to do when I first looked at this site was to say, well, yeah, five acres, pretty big, unique at a subway station. Let's get some scale comparison. So what you see in this slide, and I hope people can read it, the slide on the left, of course, is the actual site. And the other four uh, cover off um, the distillery district, the St. Lawrence Market super blocks, um, and uh, the Evergreen Brickworks, and Liberty Village. And it, you can just spend a second and look at those four slides and realize how much activity goes on within that exact same land area that uh, the Coxwell Danforth garage uh, equates to. So that opened up my eyes and I think it opened a, a lot of people's eyes uh, in the community and on the panel. Next. Okay, so I'm gonna run through uh, the highlights of the report. We basically came up with five overall recommendations and themes, and this is the first one. Basically to think outside the box, you can see the site in context here at uh, Coxwell and Danforth, but what's perhaps just as important is what's around it. There is the city municipal parking lot site on the north side of Danforth. There's of course the subway station, um, just to the north, there is a big surface parking lot next to a shopper's drugstore um, and other uh, municipal uh, buildings and property. So one of the first recommendations is, is look at this as a district, not just the site, and unlock the potential for funding through partners uh, in the city and the private sector. So that's the first recommendation that came out of our work. Second. Uh, second is don't be afraid of density. Um, we actually think that increasing the allowed density in the site as well as these city owned properties is really, really important. Uh, as you can see from those previous scale comparison slides, you can accommodate a lot. You can accommodate a mix of uh, cultural, of, of employment, of residential, of institutional, uh, community, et cetera, et cetera, on that, on that super block. And the bottom line is we recommended that a minimum of 750,000 square foot of market housing has to be put into the mix to help achieve the goals and the overall vision uh, of a community hub for the Barnes. The third recommendation was really simple. It was something I learned from Jane Jacobs a long time ago. She said, often people have a hell of a time trying to figure out where to start. And when I found out that the community has been looking at this for 18 years, 
I think one of the things we, we need to figure out is just start. Treat the barns like a business incubator and start introducing interim uses. And I suggested a phenomenal opportunity right now, the planning ought to start, to just open the site up to doors open in May 27 to 28 in 2023 and let Torontonians come to the site, discover it for the first time, see, feel, touch, look at the potential for all these different possible uses and I think it'll pay huge dividends. So that was our third recommendation. Next. The fourth one is what we call future-proofing the site. You gotta test different options in terms of the circulation network, what will work, what does not work, why, what, what other uses might be better. Generally, we would expect that most people will come to the site by transit, but obviously some people will drive. And there, of course, are deliveries and vehicular activities that need to be thought about and tested carefully on the site. So that was our fourth recommendation. And the last one, the fifth, was to attract a creative long-term development and developer and funding partner who can help kickstart the revitalization of this site, unlock the other potential city-owned real estate sites, and begin the, a, a phasing strategy and maintain the property over time. That's a tall order, but there are developers like that, uh, certainly all throughout uh, Canada, and uh, it's really, really important for a CREATO to do that uh, detailed search and to find that type of developer who has that mindset that wants to be there, wants to make this work and can make something happen here. So those are the five recommendations. The last thing I wanna say is very simple before I pass it over <clears throat> is, you know, what's new since we did the report in May? <clears throat> well, change is what's new. Um, Evolving context of the Danforth. City completed a study, but there, and there has been developers that have built mid-rise buildings. Some of you may know there is now an active application for a 49-story <clears throat> tower at Pape and Danforth, where the Danforth subway line will intersect with the new Ontario line. Um, so people are discovering the potential of the Danforth, and I think that's going to continue. The, the, the second thing is the provincial government has been extremely active with bills 108, 109, and 23, which in, an, in a nutshell say, we have a housing crisis and we're gonna pull out all the stops to do everything we can to encourage uh, housing development uh, of all forms in neighborhoods, at subway stops on main streets, et cetera. And I think that is a, that a whole environment is, is quite different. And obviously the change in interest rates, we all know it's probably not over yet, um, which will have an impact on uh, the, the numbers and the marketability of what potential uses can work here. And I guess the last thing that we're not sure of yet, but we understand that the initial idea of a police station on the site um, is receiving uh, some review and it may or may not change. So those are some of the key things I think that we wanted to share with you uh, in this exercise. Okay, thank you. Now, what I'd like to do now is introduce our panel. And as you can see from the people here and their names, um, we have all expertise represented. We have the arts community, we have the uh, marketing development community, architectural community, and uh, we're gonna hear from a member of the, of the actual neighborhood after that. So I'd like to open it up uh, with the panelists, if I may, and maybe I could start off uh, with uh, Jonathan. Um, who uh, is, of course, an architect and was an active member of the panel. And I'm wondering, uh, Jonathan, what you would like to share in terms of the, your experience and the results uh, of uh, this report in terms of the mix of uses and the, the way we can move this thing forward. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I just want to say thanks to all of the different folks who participated in this tap. It was a phenomenally fun uh, couple of days to, to sort of think this through with such an amazing site. Um, you know, I think when I, when we go through the, the report from my perspective, the, the elements that really sort of um, uh, resonate for me, uh, I, I, I really look at this as a huge opportunity for the neighborhood uh, in looking at this site, but uh, in 
in creating that opportunity, I think there's an op there's uh, sort of a, a perspective that needs to be taken and looking at this as an opportunity to also uh, capture value. You know, if if this site becomes what I think the community wants it to be in terms of a, uh, an arts and culture hub, a, a community space uh, hub, all of those different things, this is going to be a phenomenal um, uh, facility for the neighborhood. Uh, and so I think looking at how you capture some of the value that that is then going to create to then put back into the project is going to be a, a really key element of this. So obviously in the recommendations talking about uh, the additional of the addition of, of, of more density on the site to create more 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 uh, funding to create more you know people and, and body heat that I think is, is fundamentally important. Um, I think the same can be said on the the aspects of looking at this as a district. Um, you know we can't the, the, the community is looking for some some amenities and things to be added. Um, not every single one of those can land on this site. I think sometimes that causes the stasis that uh, you were talking about uh, your your feedback from Jane Jacobs, Paul. Um, sometimes if, if communities throw uh, a thousand things into a project, it actually causes it to slow down. In this case, really looking at the, 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 the precinct around it, um, figuring out what, the, what needs to go on this site, but then thinking about what things can then land elsewhere, um, but also thinking about that precinct around it as a way to capture value and feed that back into the project. I think there's, a, there's an incredible little ecosystem that I think can be created here relatively quickly to, to drive what the, uh, the local community is looking for. Okay, great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, maybe we'll come back to you after uh, for additional comments. I'd maybe I'd like to go to Mary now from Colliers. And uh, obviously, Mary was a great addition to the panel and looked at, uh, among other things, the market potential and how do you animate the Danforth and what gets people excited and how would they want to come there and explore? So, Mary, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Paul. Um, I guess I'd first like to say that I, I was really thrilled to have the chance to work with ULI on this tap. It's the second one I've done, and I think they're incredibly interesting and, and one of the a really a great opportunity with uh, ULI. So if you have a chance to do it, I would highly recommend it. I guess the perspective that I the, the, the key things that I saw that need to be addressed are, are number one, the street animation. How do you make the site come alive on the seat on the street? It has an incredible amount of frontage on Danforth, but right now it's a bit fortress like in terms of um, how it presents. So to me, how the site um, meets the street and then also how it integrates with it. So and that that really has to be addressed on uh, at the scale of the overall development. Um, and so what kind of uses do you put at the street? Um, what, what kind of uses do you put inside? How does it relate to the community? Uh, we, you know, we see a lot of developments in Toronto where you know, the buildings look as if they, they, they look as if they were designed in a in a vacuum in a boardroom somewhere and they may have good looking retail space at grade but when you're they, they don't integrate into the community they don't fit with what's around there when you walk by they're, they're not necessarily um, engaging from the perspective of someone on the street so to me the street animation is critical and you've got three sides to this site so you've got a lot to work with and then the second one is the overall site design and animation. So how and why do people access this site? It's a huge site. Paul talked about that five acres. It's massive. When you look at it overlaid on Liberty Village, you realize it's only covering a portion of Liberty Village. Um, the same thing for the uh, St. Lawrence Market area. So the retail um, placement throughout the site is really important. Where does it go? What, um, you know, what kind of uses do you have where? how does the public go in there and why are they going in there? How do you draw people in? And that, that, you know, you have to think about that from the perspective of the days of the week and the seasons of the year. And then the last thing that I think is, is really critical is the vision has to be realistic. So it has to be planned and it had in a way that it is going to be viable. So what I mean by that is we, we've probably all seen developments either, you know, in North America or around the world where they they look amazing when they're planned and they sound really great, but they actually are not going to be, be financially feasible for the businesses that you would have operating there. So, you know, there has to be enough um, market traffic. There has to be enough consumer traffic, um, that, you know, to make these businesses functioning. The rents can't be so high that the businesses don't work. And if, if you're talking about independent operators, which is, is probably, you know, a big component here, um, you just, you know, you have to have viable rents because they are um, small businesses and they don't have other locations to balance their fixed costs. So to me, it's the street animation, the site animation, and then 
you know, a, a financially realistic vision. Okay, uh, that's another tall order, uh, and we'll see where that takes us. So uh, let's go to Hannah now, if you could talk a bit, Hannah, uh, uh, tell us a bit about Akin Collective, uh, obviously focused on the arts and programming space, among other things. But um, wh what were what were your thoughts on this? So we had to consider affordability, accessibility, as well as engagement with already established community members to increase the community activation and catalyze the potential for a safe and successful and sustainable society. And through these considerations, we had to ask things like, ask things like, what are the advantages or challenges that are associated with programming in large heritage spaces, formerly industrial spaces? And what are some ways to involve both established and institutional, as well as independent grassroots organizations in places like this again? So with that said, we were thinking, it became obvious that like giving the, the neighborhood, their space by giving them space is where we were going with this. And where I'm headed with this actually is like, or I should just say some possible uses with profitable gain that can include, but aren't limited to art studios with low build out costs, rentable shared working or studio space, rentable rehearsal or performance space, as we've noticed that the music and theater industries are really lacking with I guess, places they can host space for their community members. And we can consider things like program rooms or even larger halls where we can sustain fairs for the businesses in that area or markets from the 19 or 20 listed art organizations in the area as well. But we can think smaller and think about team meeting spaces or go as large as industrial spaces working with what is already in the, the barns and think about kilns or photography studios or any area where the there are technicians that are employed helping other artists or stakeholders in the community complete project tasks. These are all great places where we can have thoughts of employment and capacity gain, but where we also thought would be good to invest if we re are really wanting to increase accessibility, it would benefit us to consider features and amenities like private outdoor space for the community, like the garage barn members or providing a pantry service. And that way we can partner with communities or organizations like um, Community Fridge TO or other organizations that pay it forward and hold space for the people in that area. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Well, I'm sure we'll come back uh, as we uh, roll through our discussion here. Let's go to Marcel, um, who is the numbers guy, um, uh, developer. Uh, one of the recommendations, you know, Marcel, was to, to, to find a creative developer who could partner with CreateTO and bring this into fruition over time. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on... Uh, how that might happen and, and what, what's the reality these days given interest rates and all the rest of it and where we might go in the future about uh, the viability and the numbers. Yeah. Uh, for, first, I wanna say this site is, uh, is an amazing site. It's on transit, uh, existing community infrastructure and neighborhood character. Um, but you know, let's be honest with ourselves though, this is a difficult site to develop. There's you know, existing heritage components, uh, use requirements and uh, it's very urban. But you know, as a developer, when you know looking at the numbers um, <clears throat> on these mixed-use urban sites, you just can't look at the you know one metric, one going in yield. You have to look at multiple uh, uh, yields over the course of uh, the build-out, uh, and so that's what we do here at uh, at First Capital. So when we're looking at these sites, uh, we're trying to uh, break it down into into multiple pieces and understanding what those uh, those return metrics will look like. Um, these developments take uh, years to develop. Uh, the first the phase will not always uh, have the scale to support all the components um, that is being asked today uh, in the whole TAP program, but uh, to make the site attractive, uh, you need to get scale on the site uh, so that you can be able to uh, provide what the stakeholders are looking for. Uh, developers are going to be interested in the site if they can get scale. There has to be population growth and demand for housing in the area. 
Uh, there needs to be upward pressure on rents and sale prices, um, but having scale will allow the developer uh, to monetize the commercial to make the site attractive and future proof uh, the development and all those components uh, that Mary was talking about um, to make that inviting from the ground level and have really good uh, commercial uses and retail uses. Um, you know, that's really around amenitizing uh, and future future proofing the development and with scale, uh, that's, you know, how you'll get there. Um, with scale, you can move, you can get into having the site to be more attractive. Um, for example, at First Capital, we invest a lot in our public art. Uh, it's a big proponent of our developments and we take pride in our, in our art program, but we wouldn't be able to do those types of uh, programming and amenitizing if we didn't have the numbers that support uh, these types of developments. And again, that's through having the scale to support uh, these types of development. Um, as to your point about interest rates, and, you know, that's a, that's a hot topic today. And, you know, developers are going back and revisiting uh, their, their yield expectations and return on investments. Um, but if it's a great site, you know, developments don't happen overnight. These are multi-year uh, multi projects, but you go back and start retweaking uh, your, your pro formas to understand like, you know, what is the long-term uh, viability and, you know, at the different stages of development, what will those, uh, what will those yields uh, look like? Okay. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Do you have any uh, initial ideas in terms of, um, you keep talking about scale, in it's a big site, it can accommodate a lot of uses, a lot of activities. Um, one of the things I seem to recall in the panel discussion was, you know, yes, there's a huge need for housing of all types, obviously affordable mm -hmm. housing, uh, seniors housing, market housing uh, uh, to create value, et cetera, et cetera. Any insights into the, the mix is, is more the merrier, the right approach to this or what? I, I'm not going to say more is the merrier, but I think that as a developer, you want to be able to be able to hit, you know, return remet metrics that is going to make the site um, palatable for developers to build it um, and putting restrictions on saying you can only build so much market and um, and, and limiting that side of it um, is, is not going to be um, it's not going to help the, the development overall. OK, um, well, we'll come back to you uh, in the second part of this discussion. I, I would like to thanks for all that. I would like to sort of uh, pose a general question for everyone. And as you know, one of our, I guess our third recommendation was just start. Uh, you know, it says 18 years of community discussion seems like quite a while. Um, and people are anxious, the community wants to see something there. Everybody wants to get on with it. Um, as you know, our recommendation basically was, um, one of them anyway, was to maybe open the site up uh, uh, next spring, doors open, et cetera, and let the world discover it. I'd like to hear from each of you uh, what you think of that idea and why. Jonathan, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I think um, we talked a lot at, at the tap around the, the the concept of meanwhile uses. Um, so, yeah. what are those kinds of things that can be uh, incorporated? And, and and I think Hannah touched on this a little bit at the beginning, and, and Mary as well in their initial comments. But I think. This idea of just getting started, getting people on the site, it's a really fantastic building in terms of its heritage fabric, the, the, the sort of large scale open spaces. So creating a situation where the public can start to come in either through through uh, open doors or starting to find um, some activities, whether they're, they're um, uh, farmers markets or other uh, sorts of uses that could, could take advantage of the site during certain uh, times of year, just to get the community used to this idea of of this, the space being something that's for them as opposed to a place that is uh, largely fenced off from the, from the rest of the, the community. I think it also starts to, to sort of generate some um, creative juices for um, you know, some of those creative developers that Marcel's talking about as they come in, uh, they buy some carrots from a farmer's market, they start to think big thoughts about what could be, uh, what could go on here. And I think there's an, un there starts to become a bit of an understanding of how people will access the site, where they're going to be coming from, um, what some of those uh, overlapping uses might be and who, who some of the people might be that, that can incorporate that space. Um, 
using it for some 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 short term uses now uh, may allow for a, a community group to actually grow with the site where they use it now uh, and they come back after construction in a larger scale or a larger format. And so it's starting to create a bit of an ecosystem around that space that uh, that really starts to reflect and 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 uh, find some opportunities to serve the neighborhood. And in the very short term, it brings some activity to that space where there isn't a whole lot right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think the doors open was an obvious reference that we all uh, made. Uh, sounds like it may be useful to have uh, a doors open for the development community as well to uh, get them uh, to see, feel, touch, and mm -hmm. understand the potential of this site. I mean, where do you get a five acre site on a subway station? Uh, you know, uh, that community wants to see development happen and is not afraid of density. Uh, it's, it's pretty. It's unique. a market. It's a market sounding, Paul. Like you know, ultimately, you, you might be able to identify an opportunity where you know a bunch of creative developers can come in and start to imagine, start yeah. to tell you what the site might be able to do, um, and that allows the community and and the city to then balance that against what their goals are uh, and see what the envelope is from a funding perspective in order to actually deliver on on those those commitments. Yeah, uh, one thought I had uh, with the introduction. Uh, uh, of the uh, spring meeting in Toronto, it's actually taking place just prior to doors open. And who knows, uh, I don't know whether this site might be one of the possible uh, field trip tours that uh, uh, people from all over North America might want to take a look at and discover. So that's another thought I just put out there. Okay. Um, Mary, any thoughts on this general question of uh, meanwhile uses, interim uses? What what do you think, how do we start? Sure, I think the general consensus was it was a great idea, so I'll keep it really brief. I think mm. it's really important to remember that it, 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 this, this is a really neat opportunity because we actually have, we have existing buildings, we have an existing community, we have an existing transit system that accesses it, as it, right? So this is not some site that's not accessible, it's not a, just a chunk of land. So there's, to me, it's, a, it's, it's such an opportunity to do anything I, I you know the, the thing you know seasonal markets farmers markets those ones i think make a lot of sense any kind of food uses kiosks food trucks um you know you can even have them on the sidewalk to, to start in it to the you know to sort of start that all, all the things that hannah talked about all those creators i mean they could a lot, a lot of them are in could be in space that you know doesn't have a huge cost to get ready for them to use um, and even things like the rehearsal space that we heard about where there's been a massive loss of rehearsal space. And, you know, you might find that that's something that is financially feasible, even though there is a bit of a, a cost to get it going. You might find that even on a non-permanent basis, it was still financially feasible. But I think it animates the site, it creates buzz, it creates focus, and, you know, it's a, it's a learning piece. So to me, it's, it's just do it, just get Good. going. Okay, uh, I got a three minute warning here before uh, we get into the community. So uh, Hannah, uh, over to you for some brief comments on this interim use idea and then Marcel, and then we'll uh, turn it over to, uh, to the community. Cool. Well, I think with any regard to infrastructure spending or city development, it's always kind of good to invest in people-centered things because that's where our highest returns are because that's the people then invest back in us. And so with that said, I think that sending out an invitation to all of the organizations in the area or the community associations in the area would be a really good step because, and asking them what they want to do. Like if Neighborhood Link Support Service, which is a nonprofit agency providing programs for youth and newcomers and se seniors comes back and is like, hey, I actually do want to do a market or I want to have a workshop or this or that, then we could glean from everybody what it is and set up something like, you know, low cost, low build out, low everything to provide hold space for that. But like everybody's saying. Okay, Marcel, uh, a minute or so for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly add that, um, you know, we talked about in, in our, the TAP program about the incubators. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I think about, you know, First Capital, we're a partner in uh, Stack at Bathurst and Front. Uh, you know, you, have, you can put in some interim uh, buildings on the site. The site's a pretty large site, you know, uh, that could help with event space, retail pop-up, you know, 
uh, other temporary space. If you think of distillery district, they, you know, they put some temporary space on, on their site. And th these could act as an incubator, uh, build up the, the business in the neighborhood. And then, you know, as you select a developer, some of those businesses can move into the phasing, uh, and, you know, and start to create that, um, that sense of community around the site. Great. Uh, I'll just make one brief comment and then uh, we'll move on. Um, all of this interim use idea and the sense of discovery is what I think is really important. Most Torontonians, when I say I've been involved in this exercise, they say, really? Coxville Danforth, there's a five acre site. People don't know about it. So I think there would be a real hunger for people from all over the city to come and really discover and walk around and create a ton of ideas. So with that in mind, thank you very much for those comments. I want to uh, move on and introduce uh, Stephen Wickens, who is the co-chair of the Visioning Committee for the Danforth East Community Association. I've known Stephen a long time. He's full of ideas. Uh, he's also got a hell of a lot of patience because uh, he reminded me that he talked to Jane Jacobs 18 years ago about this thing. And she basically said, don't blow it. Uh, make sure something happens. So Stephen, take it away. Thanks, Paul, and, and thanks ULI uh, for, um, for choosing Danforth Coxwell for study. Um, actually, some locals have been on this for more than 20 years. Uh, um, that's you know, when the buses were, were moved out by the TTC and it's been underutilized ever since. And we've been uh, really lucky in that we've had more than a decade now of um, support and advice from you, Paul, so much appreciated. Um, ULI's report, um, certainly among the group of us who, who uh, read it uh, at DECA, um, has been received quite favorably um, uh, with, with, with a bit of a quibble that we'll get into. Um, the, uh, the recommendation one, zooming out um, to consider the TTC site's potential within the broader uh, area to unlock its potential really does fit with DECA's thinking. Um, for more than 100 years, the site has, uh, has been a fortress, shunned the community, and uh, the, the walls and fences have needed to come down for a long time, um, literally and metaphorically, uh, if we're to transform Danforth Coxwell into a truly uh, attractive area, and not just for locals, um, for the whole East End um, and, and the city as a whole. Um, a quick note on DECA. Um, almost, uh, I, I guess, unlike almost all community associations, uh, DECA was not formed to oppose things uh, or oppose any development project. They came together 15 years ago with a, with a mission to revitalize the East Danforth. Um, it was, uh, the East End's main drag had been a, a really vibrant high street um, uh, until it slipped into decline in, in the 1950s. Uh, when the area lost much of its employment. Um, DECA has had some big successes, but uh, there's just something about this site that um, the, the progress just, it, it, it always seems stalled. Um, DECA gets it that uh, there's a housing crisis and that the area can benefit from being part of the solution in that regard. Um, uh, DECA has skewed more to YIMBY than NIMBY uh, um, over the years, and, and while there are Doubtedly limits to that. Yeah, getting outside the box makes uh, ULI's recommendation of 750,000 square feet of new residential um, seem doable. And, and seem doable um, without um, uh, sort of killing off an enduring DECA priority. And that has been to bring some employment, significant employment to the site. Um, uh, we need to, um, as we were told by Jane Jacobs uh, 18 years ago, uh, we need to ensure the area's ability um, to, to attract people in the AM rush hour instead of you know, merely just trying to jam more people onto crowded subways to other places. Uh, we always knew that uh, office, the private sector office development was going to be a real long shot. And post pandemic, even public sector office space may be a problem. Um, but I think that uh, ULI does give short shrift to the idea of um, bringing significant employment uh, to the area. Um, partly, I think there was a reference that it won't uh, animate the area in the evening, but we, we need to uh, animate it in the daytime. We once had hope that the TTC, well, the TTC was seeking a, a, a headquarters building. Um, 
yeah, Jane Jacobs' advice was to ensure that the um, uh, that the site gets enough people coming in daily at various times of the day and year round to help area shops and restaurants uh, lure a lunchtime crowd uh, to generate a Danforth Street Ballet. Um, a college campus might do the trick. And that's one of the recommendations Paul's given us over the years. Um, and that might work really well with the, um, with the incubator proposal. Um, you know, and if we're bringing jobs into the site, uh, let's be specific about avoiding car oriented employment. Uh, recommendation uh, three, we really like about, you know, get, just getting on with stuff. Um, we might add uh, Nuit Blanche as well as doors open. The, the area is uh, badly in need of uh, uh, rehearsal space uh, for, um, uh, for arts, et cetera. Um, and creativity and funding is, is a great idea. Um, One-off uh, funds for, from council, say for police or TTC or library projects could pay off better if it complements self-generating revenue. Um, the mention of a new Tobias house sounds great as long as residents have input and a guarantee new homes are ready before the old building's demolished. Um, there's been talk lately of, uh, of um, that seniors might be a big uh, component here, might help them downsize uh, and free up their homes. Um, and, um, one question we've heard recently in recent days, uh, um, uh, and Brad might address it, of what are the odds of uh, getting a master plan do over if some of the prescribed uses such a police station end up elsewhere? Um, so yeah, and, and okay. Jacob's, Jacob's advice, don't blow it. We, yeah. we're, we're sticking with that. Okay, well, I got to stick with the time limits here. Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks, Stephen, very much. Um, I, I think uh, we're pretty well on schedule here. And, and I think uh, it would be important to hear from the counselor, uh, Brad Bradford. Mm -hmm. I believe you are there and ready to go. Yeah, By thanks. Way, congratulations much. on the reelection. Yeah, happy to have that done, get back to work. Yeah. Uh, thanks to you, Paul, and everybody here on the line and the tap and, and most importantly, the community for, for their involvement. Uh, as Steve, you know, described, this has been a very long journey, uh, started well before my time here in the East End. And, you know, um, in many respects, as has been highlighted, this is not, um, you know, perhaps some of the, the higher profile developments uh, and projects that you see in, in the city of Toronto, but it has just a tremendous amount of potential. Uh, I know we're tight on time, so I'm just going to get into some questions here for our panel. Um, maybe to Mar Marcel, I know that one of the recommendations was, uh, you know, find a, a creative development partner that wants to sort of bring this forward. Given the planning dynamic, um, the changes that we're seeing to provincial legislation, uh, the changing dynamics that we're seeing to composition of, of work and live and, and how commercial space is evolving. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are to actually attracting and bringing on a long-term development partner, recognizing that, frankly, you know, if we're going to be honest, the city has had a lot of challenges doing that successfully uh, more recently. Yeah, I think the, the, the big challenge would be around, <clears throat> there, this is a five acre site, but there's a lot of components that um, that that are wanted to be on the site. So I think, um, you, you know, the city, uh, the, the community really needs to work with the developer on prioritizing, you know, what is, uh, what's a must have, what's a, what's a, what's a want, uh, what's maybe pie in the sky, and, and really working with the developer to try to de deliver on that because, you know, not all components are going to be viable. Uh, and if something is a, uh, a must have, there must, there, there, there's going to be some, some flexibility or working with the city. Maybe there needs to be some incentives uh, to help subsidize some of those components that are must haves to be on the site. Okay, I'll, I'll open that up to everybody to weigh in on. But the thing I will add is this has been identified and listed as a housing now site. Our policy is to achieve a third uh, percent of those units affordable. Um, when you look at the percentages of units and the, the development yield on a site like this, I think it's fair to acknowledge that a lot of our housing now sites are challenged uh, in the context of, of inflation and construction costs um, that we're all dealing with right now. What is required from the city, our housing now program and folks who are, you know, trying to build more affordable housing along with market housing in the city? What is required uh, with respect to rethinking um, that that framework? Open to anyone. Um, I, I think 
I think that what, what needs to be done is a is sort of a detailed financial analysis on the site. And so, you know, and, and I imagine some of this has been done, but doing so in, in taking into account some of these different uses. And, and I think as Marcel mentions, what are the must haves and what are the, the nice to haves? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think thinking about what the sort of, uh, you know, what are the tap outcomes really identified the potential for a significant amount more density here. Um, that said, you know, if the current um, uh, framework is that a third of that then has to go to a, uh, affordable housing, obviously that increases the overall cost, even though you're interested the density. And so I thinking, thinking about what that current target is for the affordable housing requirements on this as a housing now site, um, thinking about what the costs are on those must to have, and then starting to play around with densities within, within the site to see if there's an opportunity to create um, uh, all of those things on site. If there isn't, it's, there's a bit of a funding gap. And so what other, pro, um, what other opportunities are there within the city and other departments, uh, upper levels of government uh, and grants and other things to sort of plug that, that funding gap hole in order to, to make some of these things happen? Um, I think, it, again, looking at the sort of overall, um, the, the overall area as well, there may be an opportunity to look at this um, as a precinct, identify some, uh, some tools through community benefit charges, through community improvement plans or other things. Uh, they're limited and they're getting more limited with the changes to the legislation. Um, but, you know, there's a, there is, I think, uh, looking at this as a catalyst that can start to layer on a series of tools that start to look at a full uh, revitalization of the, the overall precinct. Uh, I think that's part of the heart of that sort of think, think wider than the site um, approach that, um, that the TAP was suggesting. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I have another question. I'll just add quickly, like when we went through the whole process, one of the things that we did identify based off of the requirements that were being asked, you know, we did we did identify that we needed to have more density to support, you know, some of the affordable housing uh, requirements. Um, the other piece that we did identify is that there was other sites around uh, this site that could be um, <clears throat> rolled into this whole process uh, and add some affordable density on that and maybe move the affordable piece off of this site and onto some of these neighboring Green Pea parking sites, for example. Yeah, the precinct notion is a very good one, makes a ton of sense. Uh, Hannah, maybe a question for you. Um, lots of hopes and aspirations for arts and cultural uh, site here. I know that, uh, you know, Akin leads on that, supporting artists in creative spaces and helping make that connection. I guess the question is when we talk about the interim use and, you know, we've moved motions on council trying to push us closer to that. There are a lot of challenges also, you know, in terms of, outfitting the space, AODA requirements, all the things that would have to be brought up to code and spec to have anybody going in there in that sort of capacity. I also noted the recommendations talked about sort of low cost uh, rental space, kitting it out in a, in a lower cost sort of temporary nature. What examples or models are out there um, you know, I, that, that we could move forward on quickly? It seems to me that it would still require you know, not insignificant investment in time. And yet all of us here on the call and in the community want to get this done as quickly as possible. Any guidance for us on, on how to engage the arts community and get them in there quickly? Reach out. That's kind of what we've been doing. We've just been reaching out to stakeholders in the communities that we want to work with, letting them know our intentions, letting them know how our mission and mandate align with theirs, and if we can continue on that synchronicity, and what we can offer as well as what they can offer. So in one of our older locations, we did ask the community fridge TO to um, set up one of their fridges in front of our locations, and we would monitor it, but not totally be um, responsible for it and that allowed people in the area to you know gain access to food gain access to other to just some sort of security for their children and themselves and so because there was more activation in the community we saw a lot more people coming to the studios and wanting to you know invest in the in the location so providing services that people in housing communities need, like I mentioned pantry service where, you know, we can ask local businesses or organizations to have in-kind donations, or we can ask people in the community to get involved, like recent graduates, if they want to host cooking classes for an after-school pro program or something like that. We get things set up by kind of networking with each other, and that way it reduces the costs, and it's 
kind of advertises everybody else's uh, services. So we build um, a closer community and catalyze even more events. Okay, very good. I'll come back to that. I got time for one more. Um, Mary, retail question. I don't care what anyone says. Danforth has the potential to be one of the best retail streets in the city. Um, you know, but there's also challenges with retail, and it's not like we have a shortage of vacancies in different parts uh, of the community. So you identified that we want the sort of vibrant mix of, of retailers that animate streets. You also identified that you know it needs to be cost sensitive so that new entrepreneurs and folks can get in there. How do we close that gap between what it costs to construct and as it's part of these sort of projects with the you know the pressure on commercial rents uh, moving up when you're doing new build construction and and then how do we get that sort of fine grain retail that's interesting and vibrant uh, versus the sort of big box franchise model stuff given that you know we have limited tools to sort of prescribe what type of retail is going in there other than motherhood statements of articulation of what we want over to you i'm glad i only have a minute um so, uh, i think i think the first part is despite the, the idea of just getting in and doing some things at the site at the end of the day what that what you're talking about is actually you know planning it and laying it out i mean that's that's the that's the a big piece of it but the reality is on a site with a, a lot of density, the retail does not make the site make sense. Like the, the, if you see a condominium at Young and Eglinton, they didn't build it because they built 7,000 feet or 5,000 feet or whatever of retail at the base. That wasn't the key to the, to the, to the project. The, in, in many ways, the retail has been seen as an afterthought. I think part of it is just having a realistic sense of rents. I mean, the reality is I can show you two buildings that were built at exactly the same time, and they may have different land costs, but even without even similar land costs, and the, the rent will be what what you know someone will pay or you think it should be worth worth versus so I my point is there's often, you know, if you can push the market, the the, the you know the person renting the space will push the market. Right, so you can see two buildings, and they're within a block of a couple of blocks of each other, and you might have a twenty or thirty dollar difference in rent. So that part is controllable if you actually had a vision of what kind of tenants you want to put in. At the end of the day, but I, I also think that it, the retail, the retail is critical to how the how this thing looks and feels and plays out. But it's not the piece that's going to make it make sense to build or not to build. Getting doing things like getting more density on the site, not trying to just cantilever the density over the existing barns, not putting a police station there that does absolutely zero for retail and for, you know, density. That's the key. I think, I think that's the key to the site. All right. I'm getting the hook, but the, the key message here and go on a go forward for the community, for everyone, we need to move from process. We need to move to outcomes and we need to get it going. Thanks to the tap. I'll turn it back over to you, Arthur. Thank you, Councillor Bradford and all the panelists today. Uh, I have to say you all did very well in terms of keeping within the allotted time. We are right on schedule. I know Richard was a little concerned. He thought I would have to crack the whip a bit in terms of getting things moving along, but you guys all did fantastic. And uh, thank you for your comments, your feedback. This has been a wonderful webinar and such an exciting site to, uh, to analyze. So thank you all. And also thank you to the panelists on the top who weren't able to join us for this webinar, but who participated in the panel and provided the recommendations. As uh, you know, the TAP took place uh, this past May and uh, we had a bunch of panels from different professions coming together to provide their recommendations to create TILA. So again, thank you to, to you all. And in terms of the final TAP report, ULI will share the link to the report in the chat and we'll have it posted on our uh, ULI Toronto website for all you eager viewers. Okay, so we're, uh, we have two minutes left. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about the upcoming events that ULI is hosting. So on November 14th, we have a workshop on equitable and inclusive land use planning. On November 21st to the 25th, a five-part lunchtime webinar series on whether affordable housing in the GTA is on the right track. I'm sure some of you have some very strong opinions about that. On November 22nd, an in-person presentation at the Arcadian on redeveloping the GTA's mall site. And finally, on November 29th, a mixer hosted by WLI, the Women's Leadership Initiative at Lavelle. And always good times at Lavelle. So please check our website for upcoming events and links provided in the chat. Thank you all for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Take care.